the holiday, when it, which is uh, the celebration of Shavuot. Shavuot celebrates the receiving of the Torah itself. Okay, so you know we're, we've all seen, hopefully, the Ten Commandments, or you have an understanding of what the Ten Commandments are. Uh, what I want to do today is I want to kind of like highlight some of those commandments. Uh, why were they given? Um, what, what, why is preparation a, a pivotal in maximizing, uh, you know, the Shavuot experience? How is that accomplished? Um, we're going to go through, if not this week, we're going to talk a little bit about the Book of Root, uh, why we read the Book of Root on Shavuot, and uh, maybe at the end of that, we'll kind of discuss a little bit about why do we stay up all night uh, learning Torah on the night of Shavuot, why do we eat dairy foods, and decorate the synagogue with flowers, and so on and so forth. Um, so let's just hop right in. What makes Judaism unique? And I would argue that one of the defining uh, features of what makes Judaism so different than the other monotheistic faiths is the fact that when the Ten Commandments were given, there were 2.5 million people standing at Mount Sinai over 3,300 years ago. It wasn't a revelation that happened to one individual like it was like in Christianity and Islam, just to name those two specific, but there are other ones that, that if there are other religions where there was a God, a deity of some sorts that revealed themselves to 2.5 million people or even 2,000 people, please let me know, I have yet to discover it. Um, there's a famous story of a uh, rabbinical organization in the uh, early 60s that was looking to host a, um, their seminar in a hotel in, in New York City. And uh, they finished writing up the contracts and it, rabbis realized that they forgot to add the kosher rules for the kitchen. So they went to renegotiate and uh, they end up having this discussion with the kitchen staff and trying to explain how, you know, even if one fork is not kosher, that would ruin everything. So, of course, the head chef is insulted. What do you mean? Like, what does that even mean? You don't trust that we're going to do the things that we do? He sees, listen, he's like, the rabbi says, I, I don't make these, these rules. These laws are, have been around for 3,300 years. So the chef says, 3,300 years? He's like, I don't want to be the one to break that chain, right? And he kind of like acquiesced. And that, that's really what we're talking about. The idea is that the Torah is this awesome gift. It is far from simple to be the, the bearers of that uh, legacy. Torah, its commandments are, I believe, are richly rewarding, but it also calls for a tremendous amount of dedication on our part. And therefore, um, you know, how could we how could we not spend some time to um, you know bolster our understanding of what the actual commandments are? So, what are the Ten Commandments? Okay, um, what are we? What are we actually? What are they? What are they hold? What are they trying to impart? What is the message? Can you hear everybody? Okay, um, so let's go through them together. Okay. Um, remember that this was given on the uh, Shavuot, which is the sixth of Sivan. Okay, and then when those that was an oral transmission that was given to the Jewish people, and uh, about you know uh, forty days later, which is the seventeenth day of Tammuz, is when the uh, golden calf happened and when that those tablets were destroyed. So, what are the Ten Commandments, or does anyone know what they are? Someone here, can anyone go ahead and recite them? Like every Jew should know what the Ten Commandments are by heart. Okay, so you have Anochi Hashem Elokecha, I am Hashem, you are God. Um, you have Lo Yelecha Elokim Achrim, you should not have other gods before you. Lo Tisa, you should not take God's name in vain. Um, you should have Zechor Yom Shabbat, which is remember uh, the Shabbat, okay, make it holy. Kivet uh, Em, right, honoring your parents. Then you have Lo Tirzach, don't murder. You have um, lo af, don't commit adultery. You have lo tignov, don't steal. You have lo ta'aneh, barecha et sheker, don't commit um, perjury. And lo tachmod is you shall not covet. Okay, those are the uh, Ten Commandments in a nutshell. Um, now, while most of these commandments are self-explanatory, I would say at least on the surface, it's definitely worthwhile to clarify a few points so that we have a basic understanding of all of them. Okay, the first commandment in particular requires some kind of explanation. On the surface, it appears that it's just, you know, as Anochi Hashem Lokecha, a statement, I am Hashem, your God, a statement, 
or is it a commandment? Right? Nevertheless, our sages explain that it that this statement, Anochi Hashem Elokecha, is in fact a mitzvah, a mitzvah to believe in God. And this is brought down in the Sefer HaChinuch. And he says over there in the Sefer HaChinuch, to believe that there is one God in the world that created everything in existence is what we're talking about. Anochi Hashem Elokecha means that God's power and desire, his ability to take us out of Egypt, um, that uh, everything that God had created was for one singular purpose. Okay, Anoch Hashem Lokecha is the belief that there is a God who is intimately involved in every aspect of our lives. Anoch Hashem Lokecha is the idea that every molecule, every cell in my body has a very specific mission and somehow is being orchestrated by the divine being called God or Hashem, however you relate to Him. The giving of the Torah, Anoch Hashem Lokecha, Asher Hotzitcha Meir Tzitzrayim, right? You should know and believe that there is a God, right? I am, Anochi, indicates existence, right? And when he said, who took you out of Egypt, it means that you should not be enticed to interpret your redemption from Egypt and the plagues as, hap- excuse me, as happenstance, uh, but rather you should know that Ani Hashem, Anochi Hashem, I am Hashem, your God who took you out of Mitzrayim, intentionally. Don't think that the things that happen around you were happenstance or accidental, but there was a tremendous amount of desire and focus to keep his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in redeeming the Jewish people. God, therefore, is not a, um, a passive spectator of life. He's an intimate being that is proactively involved in every aspect of our being. Anoch Hashem Lokecha is basically having faith in God. And I would, I would argue that Anoch Hashem Lokecha is the foundational basis for um, our religion. The, I, the second commandment of not having other gods is about idol worship. The third, don't mention God's name in vain, is about reverence. That's super critical. The fourth is Shabbat. Why is Shabbat in there? By observing, by observing and sanctifying Shabbat, we bear the witness we are witnesses that God created the world in six days. We are playing a very important role of educating the world that there is something called a, a, a God, that the world itself is a, um, the world itself is, you know, it's so funny. I give these classes and I don't get any phone calls. And then as soon as I start teaching and I'm getting, I get, I get on fire and boom, my phone has been nonstop ringing. Uh, so I apologize to all the people that are on Instagram watching for the little interruptions. Uh, that's the phone I use to uh, to give over this uh, this topic. So whoever's calling me, please just give me another 25 minutes. Let me get through this. Okay. So um, when we keep Shabbat, we become a we are testifying that God's had a plan, that there was tremendous amount of intention, that He had a tremendous desire to want to build the world, create the world. We are reflecting that desire of God into the world. It's super important. Honoring parents, the fifth commandment that conditions us to be grateful, right? We have to have gratitude. We should be grateful to the source of our benefits. We should be grateful to the feelings uh, that ultimately channeled, um, that th- those feelings should ultimately be channeled into our relationship with God, the Almighty. Murder, adultery, uh, stealing, kidnapping, all right, bearing a false witness, all those are antithetical to our faith. Okay, it's, it's antithetical to our faith in a, in a, uh, in a loving, benevolent uh, creator, right? God wants us to live in a world of social justice. He wants there to be moral and social order. He is looking for a world of things to be balanced and fair. The 10th commandment, not to covet, is jealousy. Don't covet your neighbor's wife or his donkey or his Porsche or any of, his possess- any, any of his possessions, that is a fu- fundamental tenet of Judaism. According to our rabbinic tradition, the eighth commandment, you shall not steal, is not to be understood literally. Achachamim teaches that the eighth commandment itself relates to the prohibition of kidnapping, right? The Torah does not, does obviously prohibit theft, but that prohibition appears elsewhere. Lo tignov, and this is what Rashi says. He says, nefashot Specifically relating to the idea of 
you know, kidnapping people. So the 10th commandment is a, also requires explanation. So we can understand why the prohibition of murder, adultery, and the like are grievous offenses, right? We can understand why they merited to be included into the 10 commandments, but how does envy, jealousy fit into the picture? Good question. Like, why is it there? I could, I get that. It's like a weird thing. Like, imagine you know, in one of the the the, the uh, in the Constitution, you have a law that says, "Thou shall not be jealous." Like, what is that? You know, can't be jealous. You're gonna regulate my feelings. Um, now, why this particular command? So, this is an Aviezer who um, who explains this idea in a very profound kind of way. Okay, and he says like this. Let me just pull it up. I'm gonna read it to you. He says, in my opinion, the precept of you shall not covet, ladati, right? He appears at the end of the Ten Commandments for the same reason that a wise man who is giving rebuke to an audience first admonishes them about specific actions and then concludes with an admon um, admonishment about a general behavior that includes all the specifics, so that anyone who desists from the general behavior will automatically be protected from the specifics. Similarly, most sins result from a lust of wealth or immorality. And any sin in a person that a person commits is preceded by the, desire, by the desire for monetary benefit that he expects from it, such as perjury, taking false or vain oaths, performing forbidden labor on Shabbat, and then murder. Similarly, he says, the lust for money sometimes brings a person to act dishonorably towards his parents. And sometimes a person worships idolatry in order to... Um, ingratiate himself with worshipers so they will provide him with sustenance. So why is the Ten Commandments, why is Lo Tachmod in part of the Ten Commandments, according to the Avi Ezer? Because he believes it is the root of many sins. And therefore, if you want to go ahead and protect yourself from all of those things the Ten Commandment asks us not to do or to be proactively involved in, what are we doing to inoculate ourselves from this idea of being jealous. Now, it's interesting because I would argue that jealousy today is, it's probably, I mean, it's always been around, but it's much worse today. And the reason why it's much worse today is because of devices like this. You know, I can show it to you like these things, right? When you have a, uh, you know, a phone, okay, that has, uh, bro is broadcasting everyone's, um, everyone's photos from their vacations, from their time with their family and you know or even simple things like people are getting ready for the summer and they're pulling out their summer their, their swimsuit bods you know and they uh they're getting ready to show off their new abs from being in quarantine and working out every single day you know um you know and and it just it creates this um very challenging reality where wow like i want that and that's normal. It's normal to look at things and say, hey, I want that. There's a, a class I give on Monday nights at the Safra Synagogue. Um, it's for uh, young professionals. Um, we had about 50 young men, women, singles um, here. And um, we would be talking about masculinity and femininity. <coughs> and ultimately, part of the discussion was that, um, you know, um, Every single person can be uh, broken down into a receiver or a giver. And ultimately, uh, no one, everyone agreed, no one wants to be the receiver. Everyone wants to be the giver. But the truth is, is that um, you can't have a world where everyone is giving. You have to have a world where someone is taking. And the question is like this, if that's true, then how do we uh, resolve this notion of sone um, matnot so one who hates gifts will live. Why, how, how do we resolve that? If, if I'm supposed to hate gifts, then how could I ever receive? It's a good question. And the answer is, is that the purpose, the function of receiving is so that we can ultimately give back. So we have to create a space where we can take so that we can give. And therefore there is no better or worse. Everyone, has, is, everyone is charged with the same thing. Everyone is charged with the idea of receiving and taking. At the core of who we are, we, we are created to toil. We are created to do. We are created to look. We're created to see. What we see is meant to go ahead and motivate us 
So Lo Tachmod is there dealing with a basic psychological principle that is um, buried deep in our programming. And that is that jealousy is not a bad thing. It's meant to motivate you. How we use it, how we respond to it is everything, right? I know that, um, that jealousy is meant to not to, to uh, lead me to uh, negative feelings. It's not meant to go ahead and distract me or, for, or, or to uh, lead to a lack of appreciation, a lack of the fundamental principles necessary for me to de develop myself. <coughs> but rather, lo tachmod is meant to, is meant to be, allow myself to ask the question, can I be doing more with what I have? Of course, I appreciate what I have. Jealousy means that I am no longer appreciative of the things that I have. I'd rather want, I want that. That's why we, this is why the Avi Ezer says that there is a reason not to covet, to covet. But there's actually another idea. This is based on the Vilna Gaon. He wrote, he writes this in a book called Evan Shlema. And he says that Lo Tachmod encompasses all of the commandments as well, right? As the Rudivo. And Rab Chaim Vital explains that the reason it appears among the Ten Commandments is because being jealous is comparable to all of the Ten Commandments put together. So why are we so successful, so, so susceptible to low talk mode? Why do we want that which we do not have? And ultimately, the Vilna Gon says it comes from a lack of emunah. He says we don't have faith. We have an insufficient faith in the providence and the guidance of our creator. If we truly believed in the very depths of our being that we have what we have because that's what God wants us to have. If we believed that um, everything that was given to us is for our benefit and the things that we don't have are, are detrimental to us. If we could fully understand that, we would have no problem. But because uh, we have a low level of uh, emuna, we have a conscious or subconscious uh, understanding that there is a problem with the things that we don't have. And we still believe on some level that we are in control, that if we try a little harder, maybe we'll get the things that we want. And therefore we cannot accept that we are the masters, that we are not the masters of our own destiny, that ultimately it is God. I was in a, um, I was in a room yesterday with a, uh, several uh, businessmen, a little older than me, and I made the following statement. Um, I was, this, was, this was a conversation we had in their, in their boardroom. I said, you know, money doesn't solve all problems. And a guy looked at me, he said, of course they do. How could you think that, Rabbi? He's like, in our community, everyone knows that money solves everything. Right? So I'm like, I'm like and this, is a, you know, this guy is old enough to be my dad, and I didn't want to be disrespectful. I said, listen, I said, explain to me what money, what is, what's money for? What is the function of money? So he says, well, you know, uh, money just, it solves problems. You know, like, what do you mean? <laughs> Everyone needs it, you know? And I got a story about some guy who came to him and he needed money and he gave a donation and how great it was. I'm like, that's not my point. You see, money is a tool. What is money supposed to do? Money is supposed to help move things around. Money is meant to go ahead and, um, allow us to accomplish things that we can't do on our own. It's an extension of ourselves. It's meant to go ahead and help us achieve a level of, um, of, of independence so that we can go ahead and become the best version of ourselves. The goal isn't the money. The money is the tool. The money is a tool that allows me to build a better world. It's not the goal. I don't need to have, I said to him, give me an example of where money solves problems. I'm challenging you. Give me an example where money solves problems. Does money make things easier? The answer is yes, it does. Money makes things more comfortable for us. And I'm not saying you shouldn't have it. Make a lot of it. But understand, understand, it's, understand its function. Understand its purpose. <clears throat> how, much, how, much, um, how many people that have so much money, that money ends up destroying their children? or that money ends up corrupting themselves. We ratza mea, ratza mataim. You want 100, you want 200, you want 200, you want 400, and it's endless. How many people are chasing all that money in the world and they end up destroying their families in the process of it? I'm not saying, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that you shouldn't have money. I'm not saying money is evil. All I'm saying is that money doesn't solve problems. How we use our money, how we use our time, 
solves problems, but it's just, it's a tool. That's all it is. It's not the problem solver. Okay, so when we are living in a world of emunah, anochi Hashem lokecha, the first of these 10 commandments, they're there to help us have emunah, to help us have faith. Do we have faith? in the world that God created for us, that everything that we have is a blessing from him and everything that we don't have either is bad for us right now, and therefore we need to grow and develop ourselves into something bigger and better so that we can be deserving of those things that we want. Or do we just mind to the idea that no, I, I keep fighting for the things that I want no matter what, and um, I end up destroying myself and may end up destroying myself in the process and my relationship with the Almighty. The Ten Commandments are the foundation of all of the commandments in the Torah. Every single one of the 613 commandments of the Torah can find their root mitzvah in the Ten Commandments. Okay, Jealousy is an outcome of lack of emunah, a lack of faith in God. A lack of faith in God then can lead to the most serious of transgressions. If a person understands that everything, everything in the world emanates from God's will, and that everything that happens is ultimately for the best, that person will never fall in, or will, 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 will definitely not fall into the trap of jealousy. And then that, and all the transgressions that are tied into that. Therefore, the prohibition against coveting can be seen as the key to keeping the whole entire Torah. And maybe this helps us understand a little bit of Rabbi Kiva's statement. Rabbi Kiva was uh, once approached by a convert and asked him, uh, you know, give me the whole entire Torah, explain me the whole entire Torah. He says, you want the whole entire Torah? It's a, it's a, uh, love your fellow as you love your, your, uh, yourself. Or Hillel Hazaken, who says, don't do unto others that you wouldn't do unto yourself, right? This idea of thinking about the world around us, of caring for the planet that we live in, caring for people, of being empathetic. How could you be empathetic if you're always jealous about the things that people have or people don't have? You can't. A person who is lost in jealousy is a person who's, who's lost in a world of taking. They're only thinking about what they could be mikabel, what could they could take from the world around them. And the Ten Commandments are there to transform us, not just laws that restrict us. Oh, I got to believe in one God. I got to observe a Shabbat. I can't murder. I can't steal. I can't kidnap. I can't covet. They're not there to restrict us. They're there to go ahead and set us free. How? The boundaries that we create help refine us. Otherwise, we'd be crushed by the abundance of the world around us. Think about it for a moment. If you have a child, five years old, and they wanted candies, okay? Um, how many candies did you give them? They wanted 10 candies. Did you give it to them? They wanted uh, you know, a whole entire big bag of, of sugar. Of sugar candies, you'd give it to them? The answer is no, you destroy that kid. <coughs> Excuse me. See, this is the advantage of sneezing in public virtually. No one's afraid. Everyone's safe in their own hands, in their own places. Um, but anyway, so um, you have a, uh, a child who's given a uh, this option. Do you give them everything or do you regulate what you give them? And any parent, every parent knows that of course you regulate what you give a child giving a child everything would destroy them. Giving a kid, a five-year-old kid, on a credit card with a $50,000 or $100,000 limit would destroy that kid. It would destroy that kid. We have to create boundaries. Just like we have to create boundaries for our children, we need to create boundaries for ourselves as adults. The Ten Commandments, the mitzvot themselves, are there to help structure those boundaries. They're there to help create a system that enables us to be functioning human beings where we could live in a world of order, a society of morality, a society where we're elevating ourselves from the natural narcissistic takers that we are born as into loving individuals that want to give back to the world and make it a greater place. And that happens through the refinement of our midot. That happens through the um, ability of looking within ourselves and asking ourselves, well, this is who I am right now, but I could be so much more. Why, why, why aren't I pushing myself to become something bigger? Why aren't I pushing myself to achieve something greater? That is what the Ten Commandments are about. You know, why were the Ten Commandments given at Mount Sinai on a, a place, a low mountain, a place that represents humility? 
it was there to remind us that the only way we can build a society, the only way we could build ourselves as individuals is by finding that humility within ourselves to recognize that there is something lacking so we can become something more. It's all tied to, so what is Shavuot, the celebration of the Ten Commandments, the celebration of the humility of the human intellect to recognize that there is a greater force beyond himself or herself that has a, another vision for our own destiny, that sometimes I could push, 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 and push, and push, and push, and God says, sorry, not a good idea, not good for you. This guy yesterday was in this office. He says to me, Rabbi, I lost $100 million. Explain to me why God would do that to me. And I said, I could think of a thousand reasons why God would do that to you. But the question is, are you able to accept that that was a, the best thing for you? And he said, no, I can't accept it. I said, then you're never going to be happy. See, if money is what is, if I need something external to make me happy, I can never be happy. Once that thing is gone, my everything is gone. If everything is about external things, right, then those things are always going to be tethered to your happiness. But if happiness is not external, if it's internal, it's pnimi. If my life's success is based on my internal um, compass of growth and development, then nothing could ever get in the way of that. Nothing could stand in my way. This is, these are stories told by so many Holocaust survivors who, who, are, who are stuck in the worst places, hell on earth, being marched to their gas chambers, but they were, went in with pride. They said, that these guys could take away my clothing. They could take away all my possessions, but they can't take away what's inside of me. They can't take away my, my humanity. That humanity is based on this idea, the recognition that external things don't define me. The boundaries I create for myself, the, the rules that I live in, the halachot as Jews, the mitzvot as Jews, are what create the boundaries necessary for me to go ahead and establish this uh, sense of value, uh, this sense of, of, of direction that frees me from being jealous that enables me to truly be free, freer than anyone on the planet. But it's so easy to see these things as restrictions. Rabbi, you know, what's the big deal? Why can't I go to a sushi restaurant and have sashimi, you know, that's kosher, you know, it's not a non-kosher fish, like what's the big deal? Like, why can't I do that? And the answer is, right, I don't have a good answer for you. You probably can do that, but there's something to be said about choosing to um, live with higher standards, of not looking for loopholes, of not looking for different ways of getting around the system, but to living within the system, creating the boundaries so that you could be something bigger. That's, that's what this is. The Torah isn't, again, it's not a book of, it is, it's not a book of restrictions as much as it is a book of creating boundaries so we can achieve happiness and success. God willing, uh, next week we'll continue the conversation and we'll double click a little bit more. I wanna talk a little bit about the uh, horizontal and vertical relationship between the 10 commandments. The first five uh, represent the, uh, the laws between man and, and God. The last five represent the laws between man and man. And is there a uh, vertical relationship between, uh, sorry, a horizontal relationship between the commandments, right? And a vertical relationship uh, between uh, the commandments. And we'll see that there actually are. It's fascinating. God willing, we'll get to that next week. I am wishing you all a Shabbat Tov. If anyone has any questions, you know, it's funny, when we first started this coffee talk, the whole purpose of it was really to be a conversation more than just a lecture. Um, but if any, at any point, if anyone feels like they want to add or contribute, or if you have a question, you know, feel free to chime in. I mean, I, um, if anyone has a question on anything I ever said, and you, you hear this class later, feel free to comment, message me. I'm happy to respond. I'm happy to spend some time reviewing any of the subject matter. Um, that's what I'm here for. Wishing you all a Shavuot Tov. Thank you so much, guys, for listening. Got a question, Rabbi. Yeah, what's up? It's a doozy. If it's not about money, which obviously I agree with, um, for me, it's about time, uh, the most important resource. What is it all about? Obviously, Torah's laws and keeping his commandments and living ethically and under the uh, you know the laws of Judaism. Much bigger question, but what do you say to somebody that says it's all about money? What is it all about? That's a great question. You know, um, so I, I make a distinction between. Um, that was my point. That was the point I was trying to make. I don't think they heard it, but I think, <laughs> but I think that the, the I'll tell you what I said to them. I said to them that ultimately that there's something called our profession and there's something called our power profession. And we make a mistake in thinking that our profession is our career, that our profession is the going to the workplace and making money. That's not our profession. 
that's our power profession. My profession is the book of me. How do I become the best son, father, husband, brother, rabbi, whatever it is that I do, and excel in being the best version of me? That's what the money's there for. The money that I make, I use so that I could go ahead and become a better version of myself. How do I elevate myself? No one has a conversation and say, you know, what? I made too much money this year. I got I got to cut back my hours. You know, I got I got to spend more time going to the gym. I got to spend more time being reflective. I got to spend more time on my relationship with my spouse and my children. No one does. How come no one does? How come how come we don't do that? And it's because we have a skewed understanding of what we're supposed to be using our time for. Is it just about making money and leaving uh, leaving that to our children so we could destroy them in the process? And the answer is no, it's not. There's something much more. And it's about refining ourselves, refining our souls. It's about becoming greater people. It's about taking the time to get involved in community work. It's about helping our neighbors. It's about helping other people. You know, he was giving me, and he's like, you know, it's uh, the money I have, I could give to that guy. I said, who says that's the best thing for the guy? Who says that giving money is the best answer to, you know, the best response to a poor person? I said, it's not. You know what the best response is? It's getting him a job. It's giving him the ability to, to, to stand on his own two feet. Giving someone handouts is not the best thing. Of course, there are times where you have to do that. But don't assume that the dollar, the money, the gold, the Bitcoin, whatever it is you're using these days, okay, that that is going to solve the problem. It doesn't. At the core, we are meant to be individuals that want to elevate ourselves. Now, I don't think most people can hear that, Izzy, unfortunately, because most people are living a, uh, a superficial, living in a superficial reality. They've already bought into what I call superficial or counterfeit pleasure. They would much rather spend time making a million dollars than seeing the value and spending 40 hours with their kids and building that relationship. They'd rather spend time, you know, flying around jet setting than, you know, volunteering in a old age home and helping, helping people. There, there's, there's something lacking in the way we, 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 you know, where we put our priorities and our values. So I, you can't convince someone that uh, there's no easy conversation you can have with someone who doesn't understand those values. But I think you could just keep making the point that like, ultimately you give me an example of where money makes things better. Money is not the solution. Okay. How we use our money can make things better. But if you have a choice between getting wisdom or wealth, what do you choose? And I can't tell you how many people will tell me wealth is more important than wisdom. And it's a mistake because if you have all the wealth and no wisdom, you know what happens to your wealth? Shh, goodbye, shalom, it's over, it's gone. But if you have wisdom, okay, and now you know how to apply that wealth, you could do amazing things. So, you know, I think that the answer is uh, to your question is that we are here to become better versions of ourselves. The money is a tool to help us do that. That's not my full-time job. My full-time job is being the best father, the best husband, I, I, I go out of my way. I spend time every week thinking about how I, what I can do to make my wife happier, what I can do to help my kids and the things that they're going through, what I can do to serve the people that I serve. Like that's, that's, that's ultimately what we're all meant to be doing with our time. There's going to be a time in the not so distant future where most of these jobs that are around today are, will be gone. Okay. They'll be gone. Right. A hundred years ago, 95% of the jobs in the world were farming. It's gone. Ninety-five percent. There's no. There's today six percent of the six percent of the jobs in the world today are are farming related, and I want you to know there's gonna be another revolution. It's gonna be the technological robotics revolution, and it's gonna change everything again. Automation, you know, driverless cars. Eight million people in the world will lose their in America will lose their jobs because they won't be able to drive anymore. The world's changing, and if we don't create a society that helps us value not the things that we do to create value, like meaning we all see our wealth based on our credit score. Oh. I got 8, 840. I'm good, right? That's, that's my value. That's not your value. Real value in our society should be based on how much we refine ourselves, become more deep, deep, how we can become better individuals, how we can become people that are more empathetic and giving and loving and sharing and kind. And that's, that's the real capital that I want to see uh, people finding value in. But as long as it's money, it's always going to be superficial. All right. Any other questions? All right, ladies and gents, we'll see you, God willing, on Friday for uh, Action for the Soul. And if not then, wishing you all Shabbat Shalom. And Thursday night, you want, virtually, we're going to have a big Lagba Omer session here. We're going to have a band, and we're going to have some speeches for the night. And if you want to come to the city, we'll have food as well. We're going to be open. 
Uh, so we'd love to see you here if you could make it. And if not, again, wishing you a Lagma Omer, a Sameach, if you could say that, and a Shabbat Shalom. Thank you so much for listening. Take care, guys.